reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Dr. Hayek, I'm interested in your impressions of the empirical work that was being done by American economists. When you came here, it must have struck you rather forcibly. I mean, the stuff that was being done at the National Bureau, uh, stuff on business cycles, in which mm. I think you were interested at one time. Well, I got interested by my visit to the United States. When I came here as a young man, 23, I found that I had nothing had to learn in economic theory. Economic theory, I mean, the, um, the American economic theorists had a great reputation at that time. But by the time I arrived, the few who were surviving were old men. And current teaching wasn't really interesting from a theoretical point of view. But uh, I was actually attached to New York University, but I gate crashed into Columbia. And I was working on in the New York Public Library on the same table with Willard Thorpe and uh, other people from the National Bureau. So I was drawn into that circle and uh, learned a great deal about the descriptive statistical work. In fact, I owe part of my later career to the fact that they learned the technique of time series analysis at that time and was the only person uh, in Austria, anyhow, who knew it. And so I became director of the new Institute of Business Cycle Research. Uh, in, this was in Vienna? That was in Vienna, yes. And uh, I think as uh, information about current affairs is very valuable, the expectation that you will learn much for the explanation of events is largely deceptive. The, you cannot build a theory on the basis of statistical information, because it's not aggregates and averages which operate upon each other, but individual action. And uh, you cannot use statistics to explain the extremely complex structures of society. So while I value statistics as an information about current events, I think its scientific value is rather much more limited than the American economists of the last 30 or 40 years have believed. Uh, you've left, I've left you at one point. If you say that the description of aggregates and the uses of statistics don't help you much to explain things. And if you say that they help with contemporary events, they cease to be contemporary very soon. Oh, yes. And you have built up a body of data. Now, how important are those data? Well, they give you an indication of what has probably happened in society during the last six months. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see any more optimistic possibility for the application of statistics? Not really in economics. Demography, yes. Uh, in all fields, we have to deal with true mass phenomena, but economics has not to deal with mass phenomena in a strict sense. You know we have a sufficient large number of events to apply the theory of probability. And proper statistics begins, we have to deal with probabilities. Well, all the sciences begin with that, yes. the amassing of what might seem to be formless data. Would you tell us a little more about why you think this is not true in economics? Do you really think that most of economics takes place in discrete, isolated events, decisions, judgments? Well, it leads very deep into methodological issues, but uh, the model of science is, uh, of course, the physical science in the original form are sciences of relatively simple phenomena where you can explain what you observe 
as functions of two or three variables only. All the traditional laws of mechanics can be formulated as functions of two or three variables. Now, there's another extreme field of mass phenomena proper, where we know you cannot get the information on the particular events, but can substitute probabilities for them. But there's unfortunately an intermediate event where you have to deal with complex phenomena, which on the one hand are so complex that you cannot ascertain all the individual events, but are not sufficiently mass phenomena to be able to substitute uh, probabilities for information of the individual events. In that field, I'm afraid we are very limited. We can build up beautiful theories which would explain everything if we could fit in into the blanks of the formula the specific information. But we never have all the specific information. Therefore, all we can explain is what I call, I like to use the term pattern prediction. You can predict what sort of pattern will form itself, but the specific but the uh, manifestation of it depends on the number of specific data which you can never all ascertain. Therefore, in that intermediate field, intermediate between the fields where you can ascertain all the data and the field where you can substitute uh, probabilities for the data, you are very limited in your predictive capacities. Which really leads to the fact that, as one of my students once told me, that nearly everything I say about the methodology of economics amounts to a limitation of the possible knowledge. It's true. I admit it. I have come to the conclusion that in that field, which someone has called the uh, organized complexity, as distinct from disorganized complexity. Warren Weaver. Yes, exactly. Warren Weaver spoke about this. Our Capacity of prediction in a scientific sense is very seriously limited. We must put up with this. We can only understand the principle on which things operate, but these explanations of the principles, sometimes call them, do not enable us to make specific predictions of what will happen tomorrow. I was listening just to that uh, wireless here, where the people were speaking about the inevitable depression. Oh yes, I also know a depression will come, but within six months or three years, I have the slightest idea that I don't think anybody has. <laughs> yes, life is a terminal <laughs> disease. <laughs> but could you give me some examples of questions to which you, I mean, about economics or in economics, mm. questions to which you would like answers, to which you do not have any satisfactory or well, any price movements of the future. Any price movements? Yes. No, no way of predicting them. Well, well, it's exaggerating. There are instances where you can form a shrewd idea of what's likely to happen. But in that case, of course, the price movements which you anticipate, uh, which you expect, already anticipated in current prices, and are no longer true. And uh, the only interesting things are the unforeseen price movements. They, by definition, you cannot foresee. Uh, you were expressing your respect for Frank Knight. And once he said with great exasperation, the difference between the physical sciences and the social sciences is that in the physical sciences, they don't care what you say about them. Mm. But in the social sciences, you affect the subject matter by talking about it. Now, to the degree to which people in government think they can affect economic policy, mm. where they're fine-tuning, to use mm. that old Fresh phrase, large or large-scale right. changes, by either changes in money supply or attempts to influence credit or so on, do you feel that we know enough to be able to make any of that kind of prediction I'm sure not. plausible? I'm sure not. I don't think all this fine-tuning, uh, well, you see, that really comes back to my basic approach to economics, that uh, economic mechanism is a process of adaptation to widely dispersed knowledge, which nobody can possess as a whole. 
and this process of adaptation to uh, knowledge, which people currently acquire in the course of events, must produce results which are unpredictable. When uh, the whole economic process is a process of adaptation to unforeseen changes. And I mean, in a sense, self-evident, because we had weren't, they, we would arrange things once and for all and could just go on with our original plans. You mean if those who knew really knew yes. and acted upon what they knew. Are you saying that the social sciences, particularly economics as an example, are much more complicated than physical sciences? Uh, well, not the sciences. The subject is much more complicated simply in the sense that any theory would have a larger number of data to insert than any physical theory. Uh, but as I started, as I said a moment ago, I mean, all the formula mechanics have only two or three variables mm -hmm. in them. Mm -hmm. Of course, in real life, you can use this to explain an extremely complex phenomena. But the underlying theory is of a very simple character. With us, you can't have a theory of, com of perfect competition with at least having a few hundred participants. And you would have to inform about all their knowledge in order to arrive to specific prediction. The very definition of our subject is that it's built up of a great many distinct units. And it wouldn't the subject of that order if it elements were not so numerous. You cannot form a theory of competition with only three elements in it. You can certainly have a theory. Well, it would be wrong, because it wouldn't be competition if there were three acting persons in it. Well, <laughs> just explain that. What about four? Uh, no, I don't think it's approach, but you have to have a number where it's impossible for any one of them to predict the action of the others. There must be a sufficient number of others for the one to be unable to predict. You say that's in the order of a hundred or hundreds or thousands yes. and so on. It's a, it's a startling theory, and I've not heard it quite put this way. But you know, the whole market is due to the fact that people are aiming at satisfying needs of people whom they do not know, right. and use for the purposes the facilities provided by people of whom they also have no information. It's a coordination of activities where the individual can, of necessity, only a small part of it. And any individual, I mean, not only the participating individual, even any outsider. The mistaken conception uh, comes from a very curious use of the term data. The economists speak about data, but I never make clear to whom these data are given. They are so unhappy about it, so occasionally they speak about even in a pleonasm of given data, just to reassure them that they're really given, but if you ask them to whom they are given, they have no answer. What do you mean revealed? <laughs> they, are, they are fictitiously assumed to be given to the explaining theorists. If the data were such and such, then this would follow. But, uh, of course, the data are not really given either to them or to any one other single person. They are the widely dispersed knowledge of hundreds of thousands of people, which can in no way be unified, so the data are never data. It's almost as if you were talking about uh, nuclear physics and the difficulty or impossibility about talking about an atom and how it's going to behave. Uh, yes, it's a, a different argument to see in uh, nuclear physics. Up to a point, you can substitute information about individual elements by probability calculations. There, the numbers are big enough yeah. for the law of large numbers to operate. Yeah. In economics, they are not. They are too big to know them individually and not big enough to be <laughs> described by probability yeah. calculations. Do you think that this is a permanent and unbreakable prison? Yes. I don't think we can ever get beyond that. Because earlier you had said something about the uh, the processes of proof and the fact that you couldn't prove anything. And I was reminded of the work about which I know very little, which I know you know a great deal about, of Goodell at uh, Princeton. Yes. On the terrible, to me, tragic, built-in trap that he has discovered in the uses of logic and in what you earlier had talked about as the uses of reason. I think that, you see, 
I became aware of all this, not by my work in economics, but I don't know whether you know that I once wrote a book on psychology. No, I did not. Oh, on physiological psychology, a book called The Sense of the Order, in which I make an attempt to provide at least a schema for explaining how physiological processes can generate this enormous variety of qualities which our senses represent. It's called the sense of the order. And it ends up with the proof that while we can give an explanation of the principle in which it operates, we can not possibly give an explanation of detail, because our brain is as it were an apparatus of classification. And every apparatus of classification must be more complex than what it classifies. Yes. So it can never classify itself. Yes. Yes. So it's impossible for a human brain to explain itself in detail. And this was called the sensory the order? The sensory order. came out in 52, but there's an idea which I conceived as a student when I divided my time more or less between officially studying law and dividing it between economics and psychology. Well, here you're, you're talking here about the philosophy which has not engaged the uh, biochemists and the bioengineers. What was their response to this? Respectful but incomprehending. <laughs> yeah, but, but you mean they, they really did not believe it or didn't understand it or both? Well, the psychologists at that time particularly had a great prejudice against what they regard as a philosophical argument. Yes. And I begin that book by saying I have no new facts to present. All I'm trying to put order in the facts which you already know. And they were no longer interested. <laughs> I mean, one of two of the great people at the time, like Boring, uh, were very respectful in the way they treated the book, but they had practically no influence till recently. Now they're beginning to discover it, incidentally, but after 30 years. I had no idea that you had cut into the field from uh. this direction at all. It taught me a great deal on the methodology of science, apart from the special subject. I mean, what I later wrote on the subjects of the theory of complex phenomena is equal as a product of my work on economics and my work on psychology. And you had not then been working in statistics? No, uh, although I've nearly all my life had a title of professor and econo of economics and statistics, I've never really done any <laughs> statistical work. Did you know I... I did do practice statistics as a chief of the Austrian Institute of Trade Cycle Research. Yes. Uh, did you know Einstein at all? I've just seen him once. No, I didn't know him. The work that you started on business cycles, I assume, was not unlike the work later done by Kuznets and his group at uh, well, the again, Institute. Well, again, it was uh, an abstract schema without much uh, empirical work. I had some very elementary data which were commonly accepted that in every boom there was an excessive development of the production of capital goods, la much of it afterwards turned to be mistaken. And I didn't need much more facts for my purpose to develop a theory which fits this, which shows that other accepted data that a credit expansion allows temporarily investment to exceed current savings that it would lead to this overdevelopment of capital good industries. And once you are no longer able to finance a further increase of investment by credit expansion, the thing must break down. It becomes more complicated uh, in uh, conditions when the credit expansion is no longer done for investment by private industry, but very large by government, then you have to modify the argument, and our present booms and depressions are no longer explicable by my simple scheme. But the typical 19th and early 20th century the thing, I think, is still, uh, to me, adequately explained by my theory, but not adequately to the statisticians, because, again, all I can explain is that a certain pattern will appear. I cannot specify how the pattern will look in particular because it would require much more information than anyone has. So I st again limit the possible achievement of economics to the explanation of a t type of... One of my friends has explained it as a purely algebraic theory. Uh, 
Een algebraic uh, theory? Yes. It, see, we get an algebraic formula without the constants being put in. Uh, just as you have a formula for, say, a hyperbola, yeah. if you haven't got the constants certain, you don't yeah. know what the shape of the hyperbola is. All you know it's a hyperbola. Yeah. So I can say it will be a certain type of pattern, but what specific uh, quantitative dimensions will have, I cannot predict. Because of that, for that, they would have to have more information than anybody actually has. And sooner or later, you'd reach the point where you couldn't do it no matter how much information you had. Yes. Is your theory. Yeah. Do you blame the layman or the working man or the amateur for wondering why in a society which has extolled the increased production of goods and services and the growth of the national product that it is now dangerous to have too rapid growth? And we must now cut back to an annual growth of three and a half percent or four percent. That but we're going too fast or producing too much? I'm not at all surprised that the layman is greatly puzzled by <laughs> this. The actual explanation is very simple. You see, we have suspended the self-steering mechanism of the market by feeding in false information, by producing money for the purpose. So it's quite easy to show how we have destroyed The money is more dangerous than the information, or is it the other way around? You say we feed false uh, information, uh, we feed false uh, in, 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 in the form of money. Yeah. You know, if by adding money, injecting money at some point, to distort the price system artificially and leads you to do things which if the price system were really uh, inherently determined, uh, it wouldn't happen. It's... Uh, no, it leads ultimately to another thing you probably haven't heard about is that I'm convinced we shall never have good money again so long as we leave it in the hands of government. Government has always uh, destroyed the monetary systems. It was tolerable so long as government was under the discipline of the gold standard, which prevented it from uh, doing too much harm. But now the gold standard has irrevocably been destroyed because, in part, I admit it depended on certain superstitions which you cannot sure. restore. Uh, I don't think there's any chance of getting good money again unless we take the monopoly of issuing money from government and hand it over to pri competitive mm. private industry. Well, we did have that in the United States. Not really. You see, they were all issuing the dollars. And the central point is that they must issue different monies under different names so that the people can choose between them. Different names. Well, we had different banks printing oh, different, banks. different money so that you built up a body of trust in one bank's paper as against another was one of the problems of the federal government, actually. Well, uh, to a very limited extent, because on the whole, the masses of people took one dollar bill as equivalent to another dollar bill. And they must learn, they must have a current currency market in which they tell you which currencies are stable in terms of each other and which fluctuate, so that they will leave any money which is unstable and flock to the one which is yes. stable. Do you think there's any chance of that ever being adopted? Or uh, will we be driven to adopt it? Ever, yes. Not in my lifetime and probably not in the next 50 years. But the kind of money which we are having is going to get so much worse in the course of time. We have so many experiences of alternating inflation and price controls being clapped on in order to prevent inflation that people will ultimately despair it. And if anyone starts my system, I think it will spread very rapidly. But we, I won't live to see it. Yeah, but in, in terms of the next decade or so, you're predicting a chaotic, almost catastrophic alteration in people's assumptions about the value of money and the value of their government. Well, I'm afraid the worst thing which will happen is that uh, in a mistaken way of combating inflation, we will be driven with a completely controlled economy. When, since people believe inflation consists in the rise of prices and not an increase in the quantity of money, they will be fighting the rise of prices and continue to inflate at the same time. I mean, it'll be their way of keeping prices from rising. And, you know, if there's anything worse than an open roof inflation, it's a repressed inflation. If there's more money, then you can buy for it, and all the prices are artificially fixed. Now, how that will ultimately end, I don't know, because... Uh, as I always say, uh, you Americans have one advantage. You are ch willing to change your opinions very rapidly on some subject. And if you get really disgusted with the money you have, you might as well try something completely different. 
But in the present state of opinion, I don't see any hope except alternating periods of inflation repressed by price controls, then the price controls being taken off and the inflation, which already has been going on, exploding again. People getting so alarmed about the exploding inflation to be clapped on new price controls. And that may go on for several uh, Have price cycles controls like this. ever worked except in one case, more time? Have they ever been successfully administered? I think in the, in the I doubt even work. whether they have been successful in wartime. They have uh, disguised from the people some of the unpleasant effects, and perhaps have been politically effective in by preventing discontent. But I don't think they have uh, made the economic system more efficient. And certainly for the pursuit of war, the functioning price system would have been more effective than price controls. Even in wartime? Even in wartime. But would the, again, the, the business of the sense of inequity comes in, and the political consequences that have to be dealt with by the politician, by the political leader, by the legislator. This is a terrible problem about oh, human yes. behavior. It's a terrible problem. You can uh, preserve the existing economic system only by making concessions to the people, which will ultimately <laughs> destroy the same system. Well, the numbers, too. Yes. There were a great, great many, even Shaw, who was very silly about many things. Oh, very silly, yes. But he got off a very acute line about democracy when he said, when you rob Peter to pay Paul, remember how few Peters there are and how many Pauls. Mm. And he went on from that mm. to hint yeah. at the growing unwieldiness and difficulty of mass suffrage in a society where there's a limited amount of goods to be parceled out. See, it's all the destruction of the meaning of words. Everybody talks as if social justice had a meaning. Everybody is convinced it has a meaning. When they begin to investigate <laughs> what it means, you find it means precisely nothing. Now, but the people who think they know what it means, which sure yeah, they, all, they all believe it will benefit the particular causes in which they are concerned. Yeah. Or that things would be more, quote, fair. The, the whole mm. concept of what is fair right. or what is just. Yes, but uh, it's not facts which are fair, it's human action which is fair or just. And to apply the concept of justice, which is an attribute of human action, to a state of affairs which has not been deliberately brought about by anybody, is just nonsense. Yes, but can people accept that? They don't, they don't seem to be willing to accept that. And under the training of voting, mass education and so on, we are raised on the assumption that problems can be solved, that we can solve them, we can solve them fairly. The see, that brings us back to the thing we were discussing much earlier. There's revolt against this. It's an affair of the last 150 years. Uh, in the beginning of the, even the 19th century, people accepted it all as a matter of course. Uh, an economic crisis, a loss of a job, a loss of a business was as, ma as much an act of God as a flood yes. or something else. It's uh, certain developments of thinking which happened since, which made people so completely dissatisfied with it. On the one hand, that they're no longer willing to accept certain ethical or moral traditions. On the other hand, that they've been explicitly told, why should we obey any rules of conduct, the usefulness or reasonableness, which cannot be demonstrated to us? And whether a man can be made to behave decently, I would even say, yes. if he, so long as he insists that the rules of decency must be explained to him, I'm very doubtful. It may not be possible. Well, in a sense, you're also talking about what has happened in the 1960s when precisely those kinds mm. of arguments were involved. Mm. And the things that seem to be to be, me to be most conspicuous First, they weren't afraid of anything. Mm. That is, the young people on the campuses and mm. elsewhere were not afraid. They were not afraid of the police, they were not afraid of their parents, they weren't afraid of the teachers. And this was something rather new, at least to me. Mm. It was an entirely new phenomenon. Mm. 
We had never stopped to think of whether we were afraid or not, but there was an order of respect and an order of obedience, mm -hmm. even in the rather free society of the west side of Chicago. Well, of course, my explanation to this is, is the effect of the teaching of the generation of teachers who taught in the 40s, which we saw happen in the 20s, which essentially told the young people uh, with all the traditional morals are bunk. In the 20s? Uh, in the 40s, no. The, uh, the height of the influence of uh, modern psychoanalysis of on education was in the 40s and 50s. And it was in the 60s that we got the products of that education. Yes, yes. It was more, I think, the vulgarization of psychoanalysis. I want to put in a word of defense there. And the silliness of the people who are the practitioners or the counselors. Uh, I doubt very much that Freud would ever have approved of this. Because certainly his work is not lacking in severe moral strictures. Uh, Freud himself, probably not. Certainly not Jung. But nearly all the next generation of uh, well-known psychoanalysts were working in that direction. I mean, if you take people like Eric Fromm and such people, or that uh, man who became the first secretary of the International Health Service, what uh, that, uh, Canadian psychoanalyst. Oh, yes, 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 uh, yes. His name will come. World Health Organization. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. You, you were talking about the 40s, and I was reminded that I think it's von Mises who had this extraordinary description of Germany before the First World War with bands of young people with the equivalent of guitars and mandolins roaming the countryside oh, yes, right. and so on. Perfectly remarkable the Wander, passage. The Wandervögel. The Wandervögel and all that they left, he said, not a single work of art, not a single poem, nothing but wrecked lives and dope. Yeah. Were you familiar with that at all? Oh, I saw it happen. It was still quite active immediately after the war. I think it's high. It reached the highest point in the early 20s, actually, after the war. In fact, I saw it happen when my youngest brother was for a time drawn into that circle. But they were still not barbarians yet. It was like rather a return to nature. Their main enjoyment was mm. going out for walks in nature and living a primitive life. But it was not yet an outright revolt against civilization, as it later became. Let me get back as our time draws to a close. If we can't get from the economists any reasonably precise guidelines, I say precise simply in, in the earlier sense we were talking about controls and so on, to whom do the leaders of the society turn for judgment? You've presented the politician, and I'm using the politician not in a negative sense, because I think it's an honorable uh -huh. profession, and one which requires great skill. The mediators, if you want, the ones who have to make the recommendations to the Congress, if they can't get it from the economists on economic problems, and the core of the problems we've been talking about are surely economic, I think you have to... Where do they get their advice? You can tell the people that our present constitutional order forces politicians to do things which are very stupid, which they know are very stupid. I am not personally inclined to blame the politicians. I rather blame the institutions which we have created which force the politicians to behave not only irrationally, I would say almost dishonestly, but they have no choice. As so long as they have to buy support by all number of small groups by giving them special privileges. Yes. Nothing, but the present system can emerge. And uh, my present aim is really to prevent this, the recognition of this, uh, turning into a complete disgust with democracy in any form, which is a great danger in my opinion, but making clear to the people that it's what I call unlimited democracy, which is a danger, where so what kind? Unlimited. Yes. <coughs> where coercion 
is not limited to the application of uniform rules, but you can take any specific coercive measures if it seems to serve a good purpose. And any anybody which helps a politician being elected is by definition a good purpose. Yes. I think people can be made to recognize this and restore general limitations on the governmental powers, but there will be a very slow process. And I rather fear that uh, before we can achieve something of this, we will get something like what Tolman has called totalitarian democracy, an elective dictatorship, which are practically unlimited powers. And then it will depend from country to country whether they like or unlike is the kind of person who gives them power. After all, they have been good dictators in the past, very unlikely that they will ever arise. But uh, there may be one or two experiments in a dictator restoring freedom, individual freedom. I can hardly think of a program that will be harder to sell to the American people. I'm using sell in the sense of persuade. How can a dictatorship be good? Oh, it will never be called a dictatorship. It will be a situation. It may be a one-party system. Maybe a kindly system. A kindly system. The one-party system. Yes. Uh, Dictator says, I have 90% support amongst the people. That's already been said by several <laughs> recent <laughs> occupants of the White House. Yes. Yeah. And it raises a terribly interesting and difficult question. At one point during the worst days of the Vietnam War, when President Johnson suddenly realized that he had been misled, that he had been given a totally false picture, and that he really faced a different, terrible kind of problem. There was a cabinet meeting, and one member of the cabinet said, if we only knew what the American people want us to do. And Johnson looked up and said, and let us suppose that we did know what the American people wanted us to do. Would that necessarily be the right thing for us to do? It's an extraordinary insight mm -hmm. into the problem of the statesman yeah. who is elected, who feels that responsibility, and yet has a degree of power that, as you have mm -hmm. pointed out yeah. today, exceeds anything we've ever known in the United States. Yeah. How do you dismantle the bureaucracy? You remember Lenin, who certainly didn't hesitate to use power and chop mm -hmm. off heads and send people into exile mm -hmm. and terrible things without the slightest mercy, and without anything to stop him, complained after three years. He said, we've been carrying on a fight against bureaucracy, and there are 24,000 more bureaucrats in Moscow now than when I began. <laughs> and he could not understand why he couldn't get rid of the bureaucracy. Uh, uh, Do you have any ideas on that? I think, again, it comes ultimately to power to the question of restraining the power of the so-called legislature, which is now omnipotent. And there's, no see, there's a long intellectual tradition which has led to this, the whole idea of positivism, that the only possible limitation of power is the legislature. When I you say positivism, are you talking about the legal philosophical po legal positivism. The legal, legal positivism. Legal positivism. Would you explain that for a minute? Well, that all law derives from the will of an ultimate legislature, which is omnipotent. Well, of course, uh, law in the sense of rules of private conduct is a process supported by evolution and the sense of justice on the people, which would put very definite limits. And it's by no means inevitable that you give some supreme authority unlimited powers. Positivism insists on the necessity of some supreme authority which 
the times. Now the authority can consist in the agreement of the people to form a union for certain purposes, not for others. In which case, of course, the power is automatically limited, and that power might well limit it all coercive activity to the enforcement of certain uniform rules which would exclude yeah. all granting of privileges yeah. to some and not to others. Well, in other words, if you could rewrite the drama or the story of the United States and it made certain changes in the Constitution, we could so, have avoided many of the yes, problems I'm, now. Of course, we didn't know. But Oh, some of the, you said before, how great men, really, the writers of the American Constitution were. They were probably the wisest political scientists who oh, ever yes. lived. Oh, yes. But I will give you just one illustration of how their intention has been completely misunderstood. Do you remember, I will test you, the contents of the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution? <laughs> no, don't test me at this hour. <laughs> it's bad enough in the morning. <laughs> Go ahead. You well, I, 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 I've tried it with uh, American lawyers and yeah. even constitutional lawyers. And the first don't remember the text and then don't know what it means. Nothing in this constitution is to uh, be restrict the people, uh, the rights restrained, retained by the people. Yes. It has never been used. There, I believe, is a single decision which it is referred to. And the intention was, of course, that the rights of government should be limited to those uh, enumerated by the constitution. And that comes back to my earlier statement that it never occurred to them that there would be a problem with federal government oh, over yeah, the states. Yeah, it's partly the same thing. Yes. But it, it would be interesting to speculate how changes of this order made in this place and in this place would have prevented us from many of the I think if things. instead of a Bill of Rights el enumerating particularly protected rights, you had had a single clause saying that government must never use coercion except in the enforcement of uniform rules equally applicable to all. It would not have needed the further Bill of Rights and it would have kept government within the proper limits. It doesn't exclude government rendering services apart from this, but its coercive powers would be limited to the enforcement of uniform rules you equally applicable. You wouldn't have needed a First all. Amendment? You wouldn't have needed a Oh, well, the First Amendment is very limited to the specific field. Sure. When, uh, I would begin my amendment with the same words as for Congress must make no law, yeah. but not restricting particular things, I but see. quite generally coercing people except to obey uniform rules equally applicable to all. That in includes all the existing protected rights. But suppose rights. the uniform rules applicable to all were bad, illegal unconstitutional, unjust. They were equal to all. I mean, you've got to have yes. some prior code or test, don't you? It's hardly conceivable that, uh, well, uh, it has to, uh, the definition has to be much more complex than I gave you. It has to be rules applicable to an unknown number of future instances referring to the relation of persons to other persons so as to exclude internal affairs yes. and freedom yes. of thought and so on. But there has been in the 19th century a development of the concept of law which defined what the legal philosophers then called law in the material sense as distinguished from law in the purely formal sense which gives practically all the required characteristics of a law in this sense and reproduces, I am convinced, essentially the conception in which law was being used in the 18th century. I mean that law is no longer something which has a meaning of its own and the legislator is confined to giving laws in this sense, but that we all that we derive the word law from legislature rather than the yes, other way yes, around yes, is a relatively new development. Well, again, to come back to the uh, religious foundations of a society, uh, you of course remember that Plato wrestled with the idea and said that in a democracy or a perfect, he had to have one royal lie. And of course, he lived in a pagan and a polytheistic society, and I often wondered what he meant by that one royal lie, because it must have meant something like the divine right of the king. Yeah, yeah. Someone has to carry that, or some institution. Now, the curious thing about the founding fathers, the most marvelous thing about them, was they all agreed 
on providence. Mm. So it was possible for the religious, for the Episcopalians, for the non-believers to agree, and in this vague thing called deism. Mm. Yeah. But it was a tremendous cement. Oh, yeah. And as that cement erodes, consequences follow for which there seem to be no substitute. I'm wondering whether when you talk about the rule of law, mm -hmm. you aren't in a sense talking in that, in that tradition. Can you have a functioning society without some higher dedication, fear, faith? I believe yes. In fact, uh, no, in my persuasion, uh, the advanced Greek society, the Greek democracy, were essentially irreligious for practical sure. purposes. And there you had a common political or moral creed, which perhaps the Stoics had developed in the most high form, which was very generally accepted. I don't think you need... I think the, that brings us back to something which we discussed very much earlier. There is still this strong innate needs to know that one serves common concrete purposes with one's fellows. Now this clearly is the thing which in a really great society is inachievable. You cannot really know. And uh, whether people can learn this, this is still part of the emancipation from the feelings of the small face-to-face -face group, which we have not yet achieved, but which we must achieve if we were to maintain a la great society of free men. It may be that our first attempt will break down. Has the growth of anthropology, with the emphasis on kind of a cultural relativism and uh, an indifference, as it were, to the, quote, innate superiority or not of one customer against another, has that done a great deal to erode one's confidence in whatever moral order? I would say it's rather a reflection of a more general public belief, a general belief, I mean, this idea of the anthropologists now frequently teach that every culture is as good as yeah. any other. Well, good for what? If you want to live in small tribal groups, uh, some other thing would be good. But if you want not only to have a world society, but to maintain the present population of the world, you have no choice. Uh, if, uh, if that is your ultimate aim just to assure to the people who live a future existence and continuance, I think you must create, a, uh, maintain essentially a market society. If we now destroy the market society, then two-thirds of the present population of the world will be destined to die. <laughs>